will now move to questions without notice. I'll give senators a moment to resume their seats on the right of the chamber after the division. Welcome back. If senators, if senators could take their seats, we'll commence question time. And I'll call Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In a blow-by-blow -blow account of the crisis meeting held with the Prime Minister yesterday, the Minister for Industrial Relations, Kelly O'Dwyer, blamed the government's horror performance in Victoria on the weekend on the government being seen as, and I quote, homophobic anti-women climate change deniers. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister agree with Minister O'Dwyer when she blames the ideological warriors within the Liberal Party for the government's horror result in the Victorian election? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as, uh, firstly, I don't accept the premise uh, of the question. As I already informed uh, the Senate uh, yesterday, uh, the Prime Minister had a very good meeting with his Victorian colleagues, as you would expect. Uh, after the uh, election in Victoria on the weekend, where uh, the team very constructively uh, reviewed uh, the results and, of course, uh, assessed uh, the lessons to be learned to ensure that moving forward we uh, continue to improve our performance. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, I completely reject uh, the assertion, the assertion that Senator Collins uh, uh, quoted. Senator Collins, a supplementary question. Order. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I know that the minister hasn't answered this question. I'll try it another way. Which of these reasons offered in the crisis meeting is correct? A. Liberal Senator Jane Hume, who blamed the government's failure to properly fund Australian schools. B. Liberal members for Dunkley and Latrobe, Chris Cruther and Jason Wood, who blamed the government's failure on infrastructure policy. C. Liberal member for Goldstein, Tim Wilson, who blamed the government's failure on energy policy, or D, all of the above, and try again Order, on the Senator comments Collins, by Kelly O'Dwyer. Time for the question has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, firstly, I reject the opening uh, to the question. I did answer the uh, primary question in that I completely rejected the assertion that was made. Uh, the, second, the second point I would make, the second point I would make to Senator Collins, don't be so negative. Order. Senator Collins on a point of order. Thank you. Uh... Order. Let's hear Senator Collins' point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask the minister to look again at the question. No assertion was made. Uh, I think the minister is being directly relevant, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know the uh, Labor Party decides to be so negative when, on this side of the chamber, <laughs> we are having positive and constructive positive and constructive Order. conversations, making sure that we uh, move forward, working as the strongest possible, most united, most effective. Order on my left. Because we are focused on doing the best we can for the Australian people. Order on government, my left. The economy is stronger, employment growth is stronger, the budget position is in a stronger and improving position. We are delivering uh, for the Australian people. Under Labor, they had stopped listing medicines. They had stopped listing medicines because you no longer could afford to pay for them. The budget had position had deteriorated so much you could no Order. longer even Senator list Cormann, important time medicines. for the answer has expired. Senator Collins, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My supplementary question is, after the member for Chisholm, Julia Banks, made her explosive speech in the House of Representatives three months ago, Mr Morrison assured Australians he was dealing with Ms Banks's concerns. Was yesterday's climate uh, crisis meeting just as successful as Mr Morrison's attempt to deal with the concerns of the now independent Ms Banks? Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I assume that Senator Collins is about to submit her resignation from the Labor Party uh, because, uh, by her account, uh, it sounds to me as if she uh, pretends that she was inside a Liberal Party meeting uh, between the Prime Minister and Victorian, uh, li uh, Victorian Liberal members and senators. Right, let, me, let, me, let me tell you, unless, unless you're telling us that you're about to switch sides, uh, if, unless you're telling us that you want to work with us on making the economy stronger, creating more jobs order. and repairing Senator the budget. Cormann, um, Senator Collins on a point of order. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Again, I'm being misrepresented. I was listening to the House of Representatives. Order. Uh, Senator Collins, 
you know that's not a point of order. I'll ask the minister to continue. Very much, uh, Mr. President. On this uh, side of the chamber, uh, we will not uh, get distracted uh, by the <laughs> politics, the politics of the Labour Party. We will continue to focus on making Australia stronger, making our economy stronger, creating more jobs, getting the budget in the strongest possible position, making sure that our borders are safe and secure, and indeed. And, and, and indeed making sure that Australians today and into the future have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. We leave the politics to you. Order. Before I come, order on my left. Before I come to you, Senator Smith, can I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of members of a parliamentary delegation from the ASEAN countries. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Businesses, Schools and Vocational Education, Senator Cash. How is the Liberal National Government helping to improve payment times for small and family businesses? Great question. The Minister for Small and Family Business, Skills and Vocational Education, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Smith for his question. And, Mr. President, when we, the Morrison government, say we back small and family business, we put in place the policies that show exactly that. There is a well-known saying: "Cash flow is king." Well, Mr. President, cash flow is well and truly king for small and family businesses. In fact, it is crucial to their ongoing prosperity and growth. It is a fact, and as I travel around Australia, I hear from so many small and family businesses who say to me, when they do not get paid or their payments get delayed, it affects their viability to operate. Mr President, we believe that small and family business are the backbone of our economy. We also believe that they should not have to wait months and months to get paid for work that they have already completed. Mr President, our small and family businesses, the millions and millions of them around Australia, they deserve to know that the businesses that they engage with are paying them on time so that they can have the cash flow they need to get on with business. But what we also know is, most disappointingly, a number of large companies in Australia take advantage of small businesses and, and uh, subject them to unreasonable and unfair payment times. Well, we say enough is <coughs> enough. No big business in Australia should be allowed to use small and family businesses as a bank. And what we have done as a government is take some action. We are, of course, leading by example. The government has committed to paying all contracts up to a million dollars within 20 days, commencing yeah, yeah. on 1 July 2019. Yeah, yeah. We're also now going to require large businesses with a turnover of in excess of $100 million and government agencies, you need to lead by example, to publish payment information on how they engage with small business. Cash flow is king and small and Order. family Senator businesses Cash. deserve to have that. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain what is the benefit to the Australian economy of backing small and family businesses? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we on this side of the chamber, the Liberal National Government know when small and family businesses in Australia prosper and grow, the whole economy benefits. Why? Because there are, all, well, there are in excess of 3.3 million small and family businesses in Australia who employ approximately 7 million Australians. And they, of course, are the key to Australia's economic success. The success of small businesses is one of the key reasons that under the Liberal National Government we have seen almost 1.2 million jobs created since we were elected to office in 2013. Mr President, as I've said, when small and family businesses prosper and grow, so does, so does the Australian economy. And that is why day after day what you will see is policy announcements, whether it's lowering their tax down to 25 per cent, whether it's extending the instant asset write-off. We will always put in place policies that back the small and family Order. businesses of Australia. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware of any risks to the government's plan to support and back in a, to support Order. to support and back Order on my left. Senator Cameron. Dougie Cameron. Senator Macdonald. 
Senator Smith. Is the minister aware of any risks to the government's plan to support and back in Australia's 3.3 million small and family businesses? Before, before I call you, Senator Cash, I insist on silence during the question. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and absolutely, Senator Smith. A shortened Labor government is a clear risk to the viability of small and family businesses in Australia. Those on the other side don't seem to understand that a business that has to close employs no one. In fact, as we often say, the closest those on the other side have ever come to a business is to proudly close it down. Well, shame on you, because when you close down a business, that means Australians lose their jobs. But you also see those on the other side. Up until recently, they'd actually promised to increase the taxes, Mr. President, that small and family businesses pay in Australia. They needed to be dragged kicking and screaming to the right side of the chamber to support our plan, the Morrison government's plan, to lower the taxes that small and medium businesses in Australia pay. Why? Because we know the more money that a small and family business has, the more they are able to invest in that business, grow that business and employ more Order. Australians. Senator Cash. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The now independent member for Chisholm, Julia Banks, says those who deposed Mr Turnbull acted, and I quote, undeniably for themselves, for their position in the party, their power, their personal ambition, not for the Australian people who we represent, not for what people voted for in the 2016 election, not for stability. Why did those who made Mr Morrison the Prime Minister put their power and personal ambition before the Australian people they represent? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Firstly, again, I reject, I uh, obviously disagree with that proposition. Uh, every, every, every single person on uh, our side of parliament is motivated by one thing and one thing only, and that is to do the right thing by the Australian people. We are focused on providing good government, having inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment and a rapidly deteriorating budget position from Labor, having inherited an absolutely disastrous and deteriorating budget position. We have worked hard over the last five years to ensure that today the economy is stronger, employment growth is strong, uh, stronger, the unemployment rate uh, is uh, well below where it was anticipated it would be, uh, and, indeed, and indeed the budget position is stronger and improving. Uh, to the, point, to the point where we now can actually pay to help ensure patients across Australia can access affordable, high-quality medicines, something that Labor had stopped to be able to afford, because the then, the then uh, Treasurer and the then Finance Minister made such a mess of the budget that in the 11 weeks from Labor's last budget to the 2013 election, guess what happened to the budget bottom line? A $33 billion deterioration of the budget bottom line in 11 weeks. $3 billion a week deterioration budget bottom line. Guess what happened in 1718? The budget position improved by $19.3 billion compared to budget. And guess what? Guess what? On the basis of what? On the basis of stronger economic growth, on the, on the basis of stronger employment growth, on the basis, of course, of more Australians paying personal income tax because they got a job under our strengthening economy, uh, fewer Australians claiming welfare because they got a job uh, under our economic plan for stronger economy more jobs. We put our economic performance, our economic and fiscal performance up against yours any day, any day. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The now independent member for Chisholm, Julia Banks, says Mr Morrison is now Prime Minister as a result of the Liberal Party's reactionary right wing leading a coup and many MPs, and I quote, trading their vote for a leadership change in exchange for their individual promotion, pre-selection endorsements or silence. Does the Prime Minister agree? Senator Corbyn. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, no, well, I, I don't agree, uh, and uh, I'm confident the Prime Minister doesn't agree. Uh, the events of uh, the last week of August uh, are well understood. They are a matter of public record. They are a matter of public record. Uh, the uh, former uh, Prime Minister lost the uh, confidence in the party room. Uh, the party room elected a new leadership team of Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg, and we are working very hard as a government, the Morrison Liberal National Government, 
uh, to deliver for the Australian people. We are getting on with the job of doing the right thing by the Australian people. The Labor Party continues, continues to play politics. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Given the biggest impact Mr Morrison has had since becoming Prime Minister is the loss of two members of parliament and his government being reduced to a minority, isn't the coalition senator reported today by the Herald Sun correct when they say the effing place is falling apart? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Let, 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 me, let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let, 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 me, let me tell you what our government uh, is achieving for the Australian people. Let me, let me tell you what, the, what we are achieving for the Australian people. We are under labour. Fewer and fewer people were able to find a job. More and more people were ending up unemployed. Uh, we are actually delivering more jobs, more jobs, a lower unemployment rate. And guess what? Wages growth uh, is actually picking up. Wages growth is picking up. So we, we have inherited a weakening economy, rising unemployment, a rapidly deteriorating budget position from this terrible team over there. There's economic and fiscal vandals over there that reduce the opportunity for Australians to get ahead. And guess what? If Bill Shorten ever was elected Prime Minister, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Cormann, on a point of order, Senator Watt. Senator Cormann, please resume your. Senator Cormann! If there aren't so many interjections, I'll have my microphone turned up and others turned down if you're not careful. <laughs> Senator Watt on a point of order. Just on relevance, I'm wondering whether any one of those senators is correct in re uh, making those remarks that I won't repeat. He still hasn't answered That's that. Not, the minister is being directly relevant to the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. My, my advice to Senator Watt, just because uh, Mr Shorten is getting cocky, don't take, don't take on the cockiness uh, of the Shorten Labor Party. Uh, don't take on the cockiness Order. of the Shorten Labor Senator Party. Senator Cormann, time. Order on my left. Senator Wong. Senator Macdonald. Order. It is. I will call the next question when there's silence. Senator, all senators should remain silent. Senator Steele John. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is uh, to uh, Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. Uh, yesterday, the Prime Minister used his role of leader of this country to bag out young people, to criticise the thousands of young people who will be going on strike, to call for urgent climate action. He said, among other things, that these issues can be dealt with outside of school. If the Prime Minister really takes climate change seriously, then why did he so patronisingly dismiss the very real concerns of those who will live with the effect of climate change the longest? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Corbyn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, firstly, I don't agree with the characterisation of the Prime Minister's uh, remarks uh, by uh, Senator Steele John. Uh, I think the basic proposition that most uh, reasonable people would agree with is that uh, those of us who care about the future opportunity for uh, young Australians is that uh, kids should be at school. Uh, I don't think that there is anything uh, out of the ordinary of the in terms of the proposition uh, that kids should be at school in order to prepare them uh, for a successful uh, life uh, in Australia into the future. Now, uh, the uh, second point I would make, as I've uh, done in the past, uh, we are always uh, guided uh, by wanting to ensure that young Australians uh, have the best possible opportunity here in Australia to get ahead in the future. And that is why we want to do the right thing by the environment in a way that is economically responsible. Because we, of course, understand uh, that if we want to ensure that young Australians uh, can uh, get a job uh, and build a career here in Australia, then we need to point ensure— Point of order, Senator Cormann. Senator Steele, John, on a point of order? On a point of order, Mr President. The, on direct relevance, my question goes to why the Prime Minister felt it appropriate to use his platform as leader of this country to criticise the actions okay, of I'm young go, people. Senator Steele John, the, the Minister was being directly relevant to the question asked. Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, um, Mr. President. May the record show that I believe this was one of my most directly relevant <laughs> answers yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. Order. No. Order. <laughs> Now, 
and, 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 and let, me, let me also express a wish on behalf of the children of Australia that all of us uh, want our children to have the best possible opportunity in the future to get ahead uh, and that it is preferable for children to spend their time in school uh, rather, rather than uh, participate uh, during school time. Uh, in uh, demonstrations of the kind that uh, the Senator has, has referenced. The final point I would make is that I'm sure that if and when you meet with young Australians that you tell them uh, that you joined in with the Liberal National Parties to defeat uh, the uh, carbon pollution reduction scheme uh, put forward by Senator Wong because of course like us uh, no doubt you wanted to have the right balance between uh, environmental protection and economic responsibility and we are eternally grateful that you helped us stop uh, this uh, terrible uh, impost Order. on families Senator and businesses Senator Coleman, time Australia. for the answer expired. Senator Steele, John, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Year 10 student Imogen Viner sent a letter to the PM stating her disappointment with his comments yesterday. To quote Ms Viner, uh, you say that you want more learning in schools and less activism, but it is only through activism that our learning is put to good use. What is the point in preparing for a future in which we won't want to live? How does the minister respond to Ms Viner's question? Senator Cormann. Um, uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, Australia is a uh, free uh, country. We live in a democracy. Every individual Australian uh, is entitled uh, to their opinions, and we want uh, good Australians on all uh, sides of politics uh, to uh, engage themselves and become the best they can be uh, in uh, what uh, is uh, their view about the best way forward, because you know, in the end, that is how we get the best possible outcome uh, for outcomes for our community. But one way to ensure uh, that young Australians can become effective advocates of their uh, views and their values and principles into the future is by attending school. Uh, by attending school, and uh, I refer the good senator to my uh, answer to his first question. Senator Steele, John, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. My final question to the minister is simply this: Will he apologise to these students for arrogantly asserting that they are not entitled to protest their concerns about climate change? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I've already indicated in answer to the first question, I don't uh, accept the characterisation of the Prime Minister's statements that Senator Steele John is putting on them, uh, and uh, the government stands by the statements the Prime Minister has made. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Health. This week, the ABC and Fairfax started issuing a series of reports called the Implant Files as part of a collective effort by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. It uncovered concerning information about the lax domestic and international regulation of medical devices and the devastating impact of this on Australian patients. We've all learned that the US FDA has allowed 4,600 medical devices to be approved for export only. These are devices that it refuses to approve for use in Americans but are exported for use in Australia and other countries without having any mandatory post-market surveillance. Why does the TGA in Australia allow devices that the US FDA has not approved for its domestic use to be imported and implanted in Australian patients? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Health Senator Scullion. I thank you very much, Mr President, I, and I thank the, uh, the Senator for the question. Patient safety is the Australian Government's highest priority. Um, uh, before medicines, any medical devices can be supplied in, in Australia, irrespective of whether or not they have been certified or otherwise uh, in, in other countries. They have to go through uh, an extensive assessment and meet the highest levels of safety and quality. Uh, they are also monitored uh, once they are on the market. Now, the, the Therapeutic Goods Association is regarded as one of the most thorough of any agency around the world and has the highest standards of assessment for both medicine and medical devices. So, Look, there's always a level of risk associated with any medical procedure and device. Uh, companies are required by law to report safety issues uh, and adverse uh, events to the TGA. Uh, the TGA will monitor ongoing safety and performance of devices that are on the market, and if issues arise, uh, the TGA will issue safety alerts, mandate changes to the product, or recall the product from the market. Now, there has been, I acknowledge the, the media uh, recently, uh, and I have read much of it. Uh, the Minister for Health has tasked the head of the TGA, Professor John Skerritt, to review all of the claims made in the media regarding the regulation of medical devices and provide advice to government on whether further safety measures are necessary. 
And as I indicated earlier in my answer, uh, uh, Senator, uh, Mr. President, uh, we have to go through an extensive, an, an extensive assessment to ensure we're meeting the highest levels. We don't provide a rubber stamp approval for any medical device uh, uh, for use in Australia just because it's approved overseas. And part of part of your, your 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 question was, well, it hasn't been approved in the United States, and it's now being used here. I'll, I'll certainly check that because I don't understand that to be a question. It's a, it's a question I asked earlier today. So our regulatory framework Order. is the, Senator Scullion, time for the answers expired. Senator Grip, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Minister, the TGA, and this would surprise a lot of people, only uses a paper-based assessment for these devices and doesn't have an expert uh, clinical committee to review the suitability of devices in Australian uh, public hospitals. Can you provide on notice how many of these non-approved FDA export-only devices are currently in circulation in Australia and their average adverse event rate compared to the FDA fully approved devices? Senator Scallion. Well, thank you. Well, as I've indicated, I'll have to take that on notice and simply because I, under I don't understand that to be the case. Uh, what I understand to be the case is that there is no device or medicine that is available in Australia that hasn't gone through uh, uh, the TGA uh, approval process. Now, you assert that that's not an approval process that you think is appropriate, so I'll, I'll be very sure to ensure that I provide an answer to your question on notice around the, the alleged paper, paper process rather than uh, an expert process. Uh, but I have, uh, I have been informed uh, that there are a, a number of people, uh, including Australia's chief medical officer, who are involved in ensuring that the, the colleges uh, and the professional uh, of the practitioners uh, are able to ensure that we're moving to a mandatory reporting of any adverse effects. So we've talked, I suppose, in your question and my answers, about approvals from the TGA, but that isn't about that isn't in regard to a very important Order. process Senator about Scully, the actual practitioners the respond. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, some of these devices, uh, the devices in question that have been referred to in the uh, in the articles relate to devices that the TGA approved via paper that were able to be used in um, public hospitals. Private hospitals go through a different process by using the prosthesis list advisory committee, which is clinician-based. Will the government consider referring all device approvals via the clinician-based prosthesis list advisory committee? Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I will ask that uh, question of the minister, and I'll provide a, a prompt answer to that question. But I don't have that information to hand, Senator. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Liberal men, uh, member for Goldstein, Tim Wilson, has said, and I quote, "If anyone thinks there is this great public sentiment out there that people hate renewables and that they're hugging coal, I say." Get real. Does Mr. Morrison agree with Mr. Wilson? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I, I have never particularly been attracted to hugging coal. I've got to say, <laughs> um, I, I think that coal is an important energy source. I, I think I think coal is an important energy source for Australia. It's, it's an important energy source uh, globally. Uh, we, we, of course, we, of course, as a government, support an energy policy framework, which is uh, technology agnostic. We are in favour uh, of uh, renewables, we are in favour of uh, coal, we are in favour of uh, uh, gas, we are in favour of all of those uh, energy uh, sources which help us uh, ensure that we can, uh, one, keep the lights on, and two, uh, deliver reliable energy supplies in a way that is, that is uh, affordable, that is uh, competitively priced. Now, uh, we of course know that under Labor, the experiment of an excessive renewable energy target has been tried uh, by the South Australian State Labor government. And guess what? They couldn't keep the lights on. Uh, they couldn't keep the lights on. Uh, and of course, that is one of the reasons why uh, prices across the uh, national electricity market uh, have, been, have been pushed up. So we are pursuing, we are pursuing uh, reforms to uh, energy policy which will help bring down electricity prices, which will help ensure, which will help ensure reliable energy supplies into the future, uh, because of course that is very important. That is very important for families around Australia. It's very important 
uh, for our competitiveness uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a as an internationally competitive economy. Uh, and uh, you know, we understand that for LIBOR all of this is a game. They're not even listening to the answer. Uh, but we also know that Bill Shorten, if he was elected prime minister, would bring back a carbon tax. A carbon tax which would push up the cost of electricity, uh, which would harm the economy, which would put jobs at risk, and which would, which would hurt families around Australia wanting to get ahead. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks. Given Mr Morrison was so keen to demonstrate his love of coal that he carried a chunk of it into the House of Representatives, has Mr Wilson told the Prime Minister to get real? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I just continue to stick to the facts, and the facts are uh, that coal, uh, by uh, any uh, reasonable, uh, by any reasonable projection, is going to continue to be a very important uh, energy source for Australia to keep our economy strong, uh, and, and of course to ensure that Australians can have uh, affordable access to reliable energy supplies. And guess what else? A coal uh, also will continue to be a very important export earner for Australia, a very important export earner for Australia. Now, we, we understand that the Labor Party in Queensland is sort of somewhat schizophrenic uh, when it comes uh, to these matters. They don't quite know. Uh, it's, it's sort of another wibble wobble, uh, I guess. The, the, we've got the Queensland Labor coal wibble wobble. Uh, so, I mean, don't, don't comment, don't comment, ask us uh, hypocritical questions. I mean, we, and we, of course, know that none other than Dr. Brown once uh, was on the record as saying that how coal is a really important energy source uh, which should be fibred ahead of hydro. So you know, we, we understand that people around the chamber uh, Order. Uh, Senator Cormann, time's expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary that question. Was pathetic. Senator Cameron, your colleagues on her feet. Mr Wilson reflected that on the booths in the Victorian election on the weekend, and I quote, there were people mentioning energy, climate, or the deposing of the Prime Minister. Oh, sorry. Order. Objecting as the question was being asked, so I literally couldn't hear. Oh, in that case, Senator McAllister, commence your question again. The minister, to allow the minister to hear it. Mr. Wilson reflected that on the booths in the Victorian election on the weekend, and I quote, there were people mentioning energy, climate, or the deposing of the Prime Minister. When will Mr Morrison end his government's ideological war on renewables and support Labor's plan for more renewable energy and cheaper power for all Australians? Senator Corbyn. Th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. There is uh, no uh, war on renewables. Uh, we support renewables as part of our energy uh, mix, as part of our technology-neutral energy mix. But we, of course, know that uh, under, under, Bill Shorten, under Bill Shorten there will be a war on aspirational families across Australia, with more than $200 billion in higher taxes which will lead to less investment, uh, lower growth, fewer jobs, higher unemployment, higher unemployment, and on the back of higher unemployment, lower wages. Under Bill Shorten's anti-business, high-taxing, politics of envy, a politics of envy agenda, Australia will be weaker, Australians will be poorer, Australians will be poorer, they'll earn less and have to pay more. Senator Bushby. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. How is the Liberal National Government helping Australian businesses benefit from trade, tourism and investment opportunities in China? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Bushby for his question, because indeed, thanks to the leadership of our Liberal National Government, the business-to-business -business ties between Australia and China are stronger than they have ever been. It was our government that sealed the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, and in doing so, in doing so, we have seen a supercharging of the Australian economic relationship with China. And this was on show very clearly in Shanghai at the China International Import Expo last month. That expo, we saw that Australian businesses were there in force. Indeed, Australia was in the top three in terms of countries for products exhibited at this major event hosted by China. We stood there alongside Japan and Korea, having the largest single presence at this expo in product presence. And significant businesses who have enjoyed great success, such as the Tasmanian business, Bellamy's Organic, was there with a strong presence across apparel, accessories and consumer goods in some business areas, medical equipment and medical care products, services including education, all different businesses representing the different streams of Australia's rich and deep economic relationship with China. Whilst there, I was pleased to witness 
It's the signing of almost a dozen MOUs, worth around $15 billion in terms of Australia's continued economic relationship with China. Blackmores, ANZ, Tourism Australia in partnership with China Eastern Airlines, Austrade in partnership with Suning, all of them demonstrating that we have even further to go in terms of strengthening and growing the Australia-China relationship. And it's not just the economic ties, the people-to-people -people ties are being strengthened as a result of this partnership too. 1.4 million Chinese visitors came to Australia in the year to March, 185,000 Chinese students studied in Australia, all of the great signals for the strength of this relationship into the future. Senator Bush, be a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary. Uh, what has industry's response been to these measures? Senator Birmingham. Well, industry has seized the opportunities created by our partnership with China, by the leadership of our government in getting the China Australia Free Trade Agreement done. Industry has opened up trade, seeing some 22 per cent growth in two way trade last year. Our exports of wine, milk powder, skin care products more than doubled. Our nickel exports more than quadrupled. Exports of lobster and table grapes grew eightfold. And all of this translates into economic opportunities for Australian businesses and employment opportunities that secure the prosperity of Australian families. Tasmanian businesses, such as Hellier's Road Distillery, producing quality whiskies that they export to over 20 countries. They've become Australia's biggest selling overseas whisky, and indeed they've embraced the opportunity of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, saying there's no doubt the free trade agreements have facilitated the increased number of inquiries from Asia. Thanks to the FTAs, we've been able to build up several Asian contacts. We're now building relationships Order. with, creating more opportunities Senator in Tasmania. Bush be a final. There's too much noise in the chamber. Senator Bush, be a final supplementary question. Thank you again, Mr. President. What benefits does this bring to Australian businesses, farmers, and jobs? Senator Birmingham. Well, all Australian states and territories have seen real benefits, but indeed Tasmania has seen particularly strong benefits. In 2017, more than 40% of Tasmania's goods exports went to China, Japan, or Korea. All of them countries with whom our government has sealed free trade agreements, exports worth $1.4 billion to the Tasmanian economy, and a 34 per cent increase—I would have thought Senator Wish Wilson might care about this—a 34 per cent increase just on the preceding year. That is such strong growth. Order. It's growth that we're seeing in sort of unwrought order. zinc, for example. Unwrought zinc order. In Senator which Birmingham, seen... please resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan, it, it is inappropriate to interject on your feet on the way out. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Unwrought zinc exports now with tariffs bound at zero, strong growth out of Tasmania, nearly $1 billion. And indeed, in terms of those FTAs with China, Korea, Japan, we've seen in fish and chilled fish uh, important growth of more than $90 million in exports. Trade has underpinned 27 consecutive years Order, of growth Senator in Australia, Birmingham, time and we'll keep to doing so. Expired. Senator Hinch. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister McKen uh, Senator McKenzie. After the Liberals' abysmal performance in the Victorian state election on Saturday, I want to raise that awful but important word, infrastructure. The Murray Basin Rail Project to standardise the rail network and connect regional and metropolitan Victoria will create 280 jobs and has already cost taxpayers $440 million. Why has the Maroona Portland line not been made a priority for a project of this scale? All you need, I'm told, is to upgrade the sleepers, and it seems like a piece of cake. And do you acknowledge that a failure to build the Maroona Portland line will mean that uh, many Victorian farmers, growers, exporters, and producers are locked out of the benefits of this rail project? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Senator Hinch, for your question. Uh, and I do, I do think it was an appalling result for regional Victoria, the re-election of the Daniel Andrews government, <laughs> particularly when you look at the infrastructure spend, the infrastructure spend by that state Labor government in areas across regional Victoria, in our home state. <coughs> and you know, as I do, those areas outside of uh, metropolitan Melbourne have been derelict uh, when it has come to the Andrews Labor government's infrastructure spend. And it's why uh, the state opposition, the proposition that they put forward 
uh, around the fast rail program, around appropriately funding not just fast rail but adequate rail freight systems out to uh, the productive areas of regional Australia was supported by voters last Saturday. They actually voted for that vision overwhelmingly, with five out of seven National Party candidates and indeed many Liberal uh, regional Victorian candidates uh, not seeing the swings. Victorians, regional Victoria did not rush to the Daniel Andrews agenda uh, in the same way that Melburnians did. Uh, in terms of the specifics of the project you mentioned, Senator Hinch, I will take that on notice and get back to you after I've spoken to the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, but I do think that uh, when we look at what regional Victorians Order. care about Senator Carr. Uh, and the, the promotion of agriculture, the assuredness around investing in regional schools and regional hospitals, nurses and the like, uh, Daniel Andrews and his appalling government's track record was wholeheartedly rejected, wholeheartedly rejected by regional Victoria on Saturday. Senator Hinch, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, the Maroona Portland line has big support among voters in South West and North West Victoria. It would reduce thousands of truck movements each day. It would ensure greater commuter, uh, commuter safety. I'm wondering, when you're talking to the Deputy Prime Minister, how they justify this bureaucratic madness that the Maroona Portland line was left out of this project in the first place. Senator McKenzie. Uh, yes, Senator Hinch, I'd be happy to do that. Senator Hinch, do you wish to exercise your right for another supplementary question? And I'll pass on that one. Thank you. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The former Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party, Julie Bishop, has called on the Morrison government to work with Labor to secure a bipartisan agreement on the National Energy Guarantee yeah, yeah. to, and I quote Ms Bishop, establish a long-term stable regulatory framework that will support private sector investment and generation capacity. Does the Prime Minister agree with Ms Bishop? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I 100 per cent agree with uh, Ms. Bishop that we should have a bipartisan uh, policy framework which supports lower electricity prices, more reliable energy supplies. Uh, and and, and you know, if, if the Labor Party wants to walk away from its obsession of a, for a carbon tax, which will harm the economy and harm families, we're all ears. If you want to, if you want to drop uh, your completely irresponsible pursuit of an excessive renewable energy targets, uh, then we're all ears. If you want to work with us uh, in, in relation to a sensible, appropriately balanced energy policy framework, uh, which helps to facilitate investment into increased energy supplies and which helps bring electricity prices down, we are all ears. Uh, Bill Shorten was never prepared to do it. Bill Shorten was never prepared to uh, constructively engage with former Prime Minister Turnbull when he did pursue uh, the uh, National Energy Guarantee. The opportunity was there for Mr Shorten, but of course Mr Shorten chose to do what he always does. He played politics, he put his perceived political self-interest ahead of the national interest. That's what, Mr. Shorten, that's what Mr Shorten did, and he's still playing politics. Our focus is on doing the right thing uh, by Australians, our focus is on doing the right thing by Australian families, our, our focus is on bringing electricity prices down, making sure that we uh, continue to uh, keep the lights on, uh, provide energy supplies, reliable energy supplies, and do so in a way uh, that is uh, environmentally as efficient as possible. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. In August, Mr Morrison declared that, and I quote, if you're for lower electricity prices, you're for, you're for the National Energy Guarantee. So is Mr Morrison for the National Energy Guarantee? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister and every uh, single Liberal and uh, national member and senator is for lower electricity prices, for more reliable energy supplies, uh, and indeed we are, in, we are for ensuring that we deliver lower electricity prices and reliable energy supplies in a way that is environmentally efficient. What we are against uh, is uh, driving the cost of electricity up and up and up, as Labor has done in the past, as Labor would do in the future, because we understand that it would harm our economy and it would harm families. You know, go right ahead, go right ahead, go to the next election uh, on a rerun of your carbon tax policy of, 20, of 2010 and subsequently. Uh, the, one that was, the, the one that was never supposed to happen. Remember, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead, is what, is what Ms Gillard said. Well, this morning, this morning Mr Dreyfus was asked, 
This morning, Mr. Dreyfus was asked, "Will you have a carbon tax?" He said, oh, "I will not play the rule in, rule out game. I will not play the rule in, rule out game." Everybody Order. in Canberra Time knows for the that answer that is has expired. Yes. Senator Cormann. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. The National Energy Guarantee has been approved by the Coalition Party Room three times. It is widely supported by business and energy experts, and the government has repeatedly said it would lower power prices by $550. So why won't this Prime Minister work with Labor to deliver a national energy guarantee? Because order. Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I've got, I've got to say, where, where was the Labor Party the last three years? Where has the Labor Party been? I mean, I've I got, I got, I, I got to say, I got to say we, we, have, we have moved on. We have further refined our policy. We have further refined our policy approach to ensure that we can deliver lower electricity prices, uh, more reliable energy supplies, and to do so in a way that is environmentally as efficient as possible. Order. Order. I will call Senator Williams when there's order. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Decentralisation and Local Government, Senator Mackenzie. How is the Liberal National Government's decentralisation agenda supporting economic growth and creating more local jobs across regional Australia? Minister for Local Government and Decentralisation, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Williams. Our government knows that a strong national economy just doesn't happen by accident. It takes discipline, careful planning and a willingness to back small, medium and large businesses to create jobs. And because we believe in these things, we can take decisions as a government, when and where we can and after careful consideration, to help stimulate local, regional economies. And it's why the Liberal National Government has been investing a record $75 billion in infrastructure and delivering essential services such as telecommunications, health and education to support growth across regional Australia. And that is why we've also developed a strategic and targeted decentralisation agenda. Over the past five years, our government has been able to shift 1, 000, over 1,100 public servant jobs out of Canberra, out of capital cities, into other areas of our nation. And on last week, on Friday, in beautiful Coffs Harbour, I was able to announce an additional 50 jobs from the Australian Maritime uh, Authority will be moving from Canberra into uh, Coffs Harbour, which is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And you know, you know, Senator Cameron, it's funny you say. It, you know, I find it interesting that the party of Whitlam. The party of the Prime Minister who backed decentralisation in the 70s in a way that the minister responsible in your uh, opposition won't do, uh, seek to actually critique moving jobs out into regional communities where it makes sense to do so. Not only will it stimulate local uh, economies, but as the acting CEO of AMSAR said, you know, I'm an ex-mariner. There aren't many uh, ships, there aren't many boats. In Canberra, it makes sense for us as an authority to be located on the ground serving those communities which we seek to as public servants, and it makes absolute policy sense. And it was an absolute privilege to announce that last week. Senator Williams, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the Minister, what are the wider benefits of the decentralisation agenda for the regions? Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. Well, decentralisation is core business for our government, and we know it's supported by people living in our congested cities, and it's also importantly supported by those who live out in regional Australia. It brings new ideas and new faces into our communities, and importantly brings new wages to stimulate local economies, more kids in our schools, more local volunteers at our CFAs, because we know uh, that those public servants that head outside into our uh, into our regional capitals and beyond are welcomed by those communities. But importantly, part of our decentralisation agenda as a government isn't just about shifting public servant jobs uh, out to the regions. It's about actually ensuring that the private sector uh, avails itself of the advantages of operating out in the regions. It makes policy sense to place those public servants where the impact of their decisions will be most keenly felt. So it makes economic sense and policy sense, and it's core Order, business for our Senator government. McKenzie. Senator Williams, a final supplementary you question. Mr. President, I ask the minister, is the minister aware of any risks to the government's job-creating plan? Senator McKenzie. Thank you. Yes, there is a risk. Unfortunately, it would seem 
the Gough Whitlam's party, the former party for decentralisation, is absolutely turning its back on ensuring and advocating moving public sector jobs out into the region, out to all, even Albury, Wodonga. We want the benefit as a government of a strong national economy shouldn't just be restricted to those in our major cities, but should be felt right across our nation. And under our government, we've been able to grow that uh, over 1,100 jobs delivered into the regions. And the announcement last week of the jobs from AMSAR out to Coffs Harbour, down to Hobart, up into Darwin, Geraldton and beyond is just the plan is just the start. We have a plan to grow our regions. We want someone mentioned earlier the APVMA. The APVMA received nearly 300 job applications for up to 50 positions. That is in demand. They are spoilt for choice, spoilt for choice for scientists who want to shift to Armadale. Order, Senator McKenzie. Senator Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. I refer to the article in this morning's Daily Telegraph entitled New South Wales Libs Sco No. A senior Liberal Minister says in the article, and I quote, we should buy Scott Morrison a ticket to Siberia. Can the Minister update the Senate on the preparations for the Prime Minister to visit Siberia during the New South Wales election campaign. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. So, Mr. President. Order. Mr. President, uh, it must be hugely diverting to be a New South Wales Labor senator because you obviously don't have a great deal to do with your time and you can ask questions uh, of the foreign minister which have nothing to do with their portfolio responsibilities. So I presume, Mr. President, that I can actually respond in kind. I presume, Mr. President, that that is the threshold which Senator Cameron has set. So let's talk about Mr Morrison and the message that Mr Morrison will deliver to the Australian community in the coming weeks and months, working up to the budget that he has announced for April of next year. Order. He will advise the Australian community, Mr President, that Order Australia's economy left. is growing at 3.4 per cent, more strongly than at any time since 2012, which was, of course, during the height of the mining boom. He'll advise the Australians, Mr. Australians, Mr. President, that the economy is growing at a stronger rate than the world's seven largest advanced economies. USA, Canada, Germany, France, Italy, UK, Japan and the OECD Order. average. And because Mr Morrison is from the fine state of New South Wales, Mr President, he is always welcome in that fine state. Always welcome in that fine state. He will talk about the commitment which we have kept in relation to ensuring one million new jobs being delivered by this government after 2013, which Mr. President was delivered ahead of, ahead of schedule. But those opposite have no idea how to manage an economy, no idea how to manage an economy, so to set up a nation to support the sorts of things that we support with our strong economy, Mr. President. Small business, the operation of the NDIS. Workers in this country, Mr. President, that have been completely deserted by those opposite because they're more interested in political games. Order, order, order. I will call Senator Senators what? Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong. Now Senator Cash and Senator Colbeck. I'll call Senator Cameron when there's silence. Order! Senator Wong. Sen well, I, Senator Wong, I'm asking you to lead by example. Senator Cameron. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Order Mr. President. On my right. The senior Liberal Minister also says, and I quote, there is a freight train coming at the New South Wales government. Is the government putting Mr Morrison on the Trans-Siberian Railway to divert the freight train barrelling towards the New South Wales government. And I think you know who's, who said this. Order. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I would uh, remind Senator Cameron, order. of course, Senator that Wong there's more on a point than... of order. Sorry, Senator Wong, on a point of order. I'd ask Senator Macdonald to withdraw that. Uh, I didn't hear the comment. 
Well, I, I, a slip of the tongue, okay. Mr. Chairman. I said Senator Cameron was in jail, but I just meant his well, friends I, I, were in jail. I, 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 I asked you to should... withdraw. Uh, Sen Senator Macdonald, I asked you to withdraw that. Order. Senator Wong, please. Your order. Order. Senators Wong and Macdonald. Senators Wong and Mac Senator Macdonald, I ask you to withdraw the comment. Order. Well, if everyone would just be quiet, I'll be able to have a chance to call the senator to order. Senator Macdonald, I ask you to withdraw the comment. I, I did, Mr. Oh, no, President. I, 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 did, I withdrew the uh, okay, assertion then that's all that I, Senator, senator Cameron Wong, was in jail. Senator Macdonald, and please say, resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. It's the end of the year, and after being quiet yesterday, it seems like everyone's trying to make it up today. While I am speaking, I'm going to ask all senators to remain silent. That is a withdrawal. I'll call Senator Cameron to uh, commence his. Uh, so I'll call Senator Payne to answer the question asked by Senator Cameron. It is your turn, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and I'm not going to um, comment on unsourced claims that uh, that might be run or not run in newspapers. And in fact, it gets a little confusing over there. I'm still trying to work out what's happening, Lindsay. Whether it's Diane Beamer or Emma Hussar, it's very confusing. But that's a matter for you guys. You'll sort that out, I'm sure. But while I'm talking about Western Sydney, Mr. President, perhaps I could talk about the government's record infrastructure investment. We have a record $75 billion being invested over the next decade in highway upgrades, in congestion busting roads, in rail projects, in, uh, including inland, inland rail, improved local roads and a new airport in Western Sydney, Mr. President, which will be a game changer for the Western Sydney economy and, in fact, for the economy of Australia. But the roads investment, Mr. President, that Senator Cameron tries to avoid, but he knows those roads, Northern Road, Brinjelli Road, the developments around Elizabeth Drive, the development of the Western Sydney Airport, he knows them all. This government is delivering Order. those Senator and Payne, those opposite time are doing for the nothing. answers expired. Senator Cameron, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Senior New South Wales Liberal ministers are also calling for the Prime Minister to go to Siberia, questioning how much more out of touch his government can get and saying that any link to his government is poisonous. Does the Foreign Minister agree with, the new, with the, the, her New South Wales colleagues? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I absolutely agree with the Prime Minister uh, in relation to what this government is delivering. And I spoke about infrastructure, Mr President. I spoke about jobs. I've spoken about the stronger economy. But I could talk about income tax relief as well. I could talk about making income taxes lower, fairer and simpler, because those opposite only want to increase taxes on everything and on everyone. So we are making income taxes, as I said, lower, fairer and simpler. In 2018-19, around, around 4.4 million Australians get tax relief of $530 a year. Over 10 order. million Senator Australians Cameron. will get some more tax Sen relief order. as well. Senator, it's a Senator, plan Payne, that Senator Cameron is on his feet on a point of order. Senator Cameron on the point of order. Uh, point of order on relevance. There was one question, and that was, does this minister agree with her colleagues in New South Wales? Who are saying the Prime Minister should go to right. Siberia? There was, a lot of it. there was a lot in that question, Senator Cameron. I'll call Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I think there'd be an enormous amount of enthusiasm in the New South Wales Labor Party for a one way ticket to Siberia for Senator Macdonald. For <laughs> Senator Cameron. Order. Order. Uh, senators. Order on my left. Order on my left. I would inc Senator Cameron. Is this a point of order, Senator Cameron? Uh, uh, point of order. Uh, order. Point, Senator Cameron's on his feet on a, uh, on, a, on a point of order. Uh, I will. I think they're quite. We we all do it sometimes. Senator Brockman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to, to the Minister for Indigenous De Affairs, Senator Scullion. How is the community development program supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in remote communities into work, and why is it important that all Australians have an opportunity to get a job? 
The Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Senator Scalia. Uh, Mr President, uh, look, I thank Senator Brockman for that question. I acknowledge that both he and probably everyone in this room will acknowledge that uh, supporting all Australians into an opportunity for a job is probably one of the most important things we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, the Community Development Program is a government's remote uh, employment service that works with all job seekers in remote Australia to provide training, engagement, work experience uh, and the sort of support that they need to transition uh, into work. So the Community Development Program is working to deliver jobs that uh, remote Australia needed. So since the introduction of the Community Development Program, remote job seekers have been supported into more than 27,607 jobs. Um, most importantly, more than 9,300 of those jobs have been lasted for six months. Now, why is that important? Because the data around uh, six months, if you're there for six months, 82 per cent of you will be in a job two years later. So that's a really important. That's long-term employment. So that's the evidence. So, um, it is our this is absolutely our priority, because if you've got a community where adults are engaged in training, whether it's work experience or increasingly in work, it's a much healthier place in that community rather than one that's plagued by the misery of passive welfare. So that's what I see when I, uh, uh, when I visit road commu remote communities. That's what leaders like Gallery Unipingu, Noel Pearson, Roy R.C., Sammy Bush Banasi and, Su uh, and Susan Murphy have called for. Uh, but I agree, and I've been talking to many of you in this place, that there is much more to do. We need to generate more jobs, and I'm very proud of the success of the Indigenous businesses in winning contracts under our Indigenous procurement policy. We're supporting states and territories not only to introduce their own procurement policies, but make sure there's local Indigenous employment targets as part of that. Um, this is part of our record infrastructure uh, rollout. We, also need to, we have also announced the introduction of 6,000 subsidised job packages in remote Australia. This is going to boost Order, opportunity Scully, for every time job seeker. Expired. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the Liberal National Government working in partnership with local communities to support remote job seekers? Senator Scallion. The Community Development Program works uh, because it works in partnership uh, with local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. It will respond to local community priority that meets the needs and aspirations of local job seekers. It will take advantage of the opportunities and circumstances of local job markets because it's delivered by local organisations and allows for local decision making. So when I became minister I inherited what I think most would agree around this place a failed remote jobs and community program. So that was that was introduced uh, uh, by effectively non-Indigenous employment companies, head offices in Brisbane and in Sydney or sometimes even overseas. So we, didn't, we don't agree with that approach. I suspect no one in this place does. We believe in local uh, organisations running that. We em believe in empowered communities and that's what the CDP will deliver. Organisations like Razak in the Lands are now delivering this program for the benefit of their own communities. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what other measures is this government delivering to support Australians in ro remote communities into work? Senator Scullion. Again, thanks for that question, Senator Brockman. Well, our Indigenous business policies not only help create small business opportunities, but we're also getting more in Indigenous job seekers off the misery of welfare into the dignity of work. Of the thousand new Indigenous businesses winning over a billion dollars worth of contracts in the IPP, they've got an Indigenous workforce, unsurprisingly, of over 50 per cent. Given Indigenous Australians are 3 per cent of the population, they expect the average workforce to be around that, but they are at 50 per cent, meaning the more we back Indigenous small business, the more Indigenous job seekers we're getting into work and are actually contributing to their own lives and their own economy. So as we support all Australian small businesses with a more competitive tax rate so they can keep more of their own money, that applies equally to Indigenous businesses, we get more small business activity and even more job seekers into work. Mr President, uh, that's what we believe on this side uh, of, uh, of, of this chamber. More runs on Order. the board, more businesses. Senator Scallion. Senator Corbyn. Uh, I thank. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed on notice paper. Um, I understand. Before we take note, Senator Canavan taking the call. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. I wish to clarify a statement I made in the chamber yesterday in the debate on the Great Australian Bite Environmental Bill 2016. I wish to clarify that while there have been no major incidents off Australia's southern coastline, Australia has had one offshore well blowout 
which resulted in the Montara oil spill in the Timor Sea in 2009. This incident and the resulting investigations led to the reforms which created Australia's best practice environment, environment and safety regime, regulated by NOPSEMA, Australia's independent expert regulator. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Minister Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I wish to add further information to an answer I provided to uh, Senator Waters in question time yesterday uh, in relation to uh, the NAIF and questions about a project in the Galilee Basin. And the minister is not aware. I can advise the Senator the minister is not aware of any approaches to the NAIF by Mac Mines. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Cameron? Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Payne to all questions asked by Labor senators. Well, I really think Australians deserve better than this government. When the government becomes an absolute national laughing stock, then it's about time that they went to an election and gave the people of Australia a choice. A choice between stability, a choice between a, a Labour government that is actually developing the policies that are important to Australians. Policies on health, policies on education, policies on housing, policies on homelessness and policies that benefit working people in this country. This is a laughing stock of a government, a government who has gone through a number of so-called economic policies. They started off with an austerity budget that would have meant pensioners in this country would have been $80 a week worse off over a decade. They wanted young people in this country to have access to not one cent of government support for a period of six months. They cut family tax A, they cut family tax benefit B. They just took a wrecking ball to the basis of decency in this country. And after five years, they have now been relegated to an absolute laughing stock. A Prime Minister with no agenda on the environment. A Prime Minister who backflips on what he says constantly. A Prime Minister who the media are now describing as a fake. This is a government in absolute disar disarray. This is a government that is divided. It's self-obsessed. It's completely out of touch. Its own members concede that the government is falling apart. Now, the latest defector from this rabble of a government, the member for Chisholm, Julia Banks, who was subject to bullying by her colleagues in the Liberal Party, subject to bullying, subject to intimidation. Julia Banks says, and I quote, that there was Liberals trading their vote for a leadership change in exchange for their individual promotion, pre-selection endorsement or silence. What has it come to when the government of the country is simply being driven by ideologues on the other side, ideologues who are only about their own individual promotion, their own pre-selection endorsement? This is a government that just does not meet the definition of government because they can't govern themselves. And when you can't govern yourself, you can't govern the country. And when you do become a laughing stock, as this rabble of a government have become, then confidence declines. And not only we have, have had a situation where we have not been in a position to actually reduce electricity prices in this con country because we have some certainty in terms of policy from a government, we see this mob going from one policy to another. 
and it's being driven by the extremists in the coalition. It's being driven by the climate change deniers. It's being driven by the ideologues who only think about themselves and don't think about what's right and proper for this country. Too busy carving each other up, too busy knifing each other in the back. We learnt our lesson on these issues, and I would have thought any sensible government would have learnt their lesson. And for, pri and for this Prime Minister Morrison to compare himself with the new Premier in Victoria is just a joke. He is not anywhere near the capacity and the Thank position. Thank you, Senator Cameron. Your time has expired. Senator Abetz. Madam Deputy President, it's not often that one would agree with Senator Cameron, but when he described himself and the Labor Party caucus as lobotomised zombies, he got it right. He got it absolutely right, and his speech this afternoon shows that he is a classic example of those lobotomised zombies to whom he referred. The simple fact is that Senator Cameron and the Australian Labor Party will talk politics and play politics with their question time, as they did today. Was there a policy on health? No. Was there a question on education? No. Was there a question on employment? No. And so the list goes on. All it was was about, and, and here we have the lobotomised zombie continuing with interjections in circumstances where we listen to his dribble in silence, but the Labor Party continuing to interject. But they assert that somehow we are the bullies, yet their behaviour clearly displays how they behave, not only in this place, but of course even more so behind closed doors. Look, the simple fact is that every party from time to time has its difficulties. Uh, today, for us, it was the Liberal member for Chisholm, but a member who rejoices in the surname of Husick might bring the Labor Party back to the ground. We all have these situations, and you know what? The Australian people aren't actually interested. What they are interested in is who has created employment and opportunity. And so when Senator Cameron talks about the Liberals putting a wrecking ball through decency, is he talking about the 1.1 million Australians that have been taken off the scrap heap of unemployment and placed into the opportunities that are provided by employment? The Labor Party is silent. They cannot believe that that which we promised in 2013, which they laughed at, which they scorned, which they ridiculed, that we would create within the first five years one million jobs. We came in earlier than the five years with those one million jobs. Why? Because we created the economic certainty, something that the Australian Labor Party could never do. In my own home state, 8.1% was the unemployment rate when Mr Shorten was finally dismissed as the Minister for so-called Employment and Workplace Relations in the then Rudd government by the people of Australia. 8.1 per cent. Today it is well below 6 per cent, if I've got it correct, at 5.6 per cent. That is a transformation for thousands of my fellow Tasmanians who today have a job. Today, we have less people dependent on welfare than has been, I think, for about 25 years. That is transformational. That is what true decency in a society is all about. It's not all the hyperbole and socialist rhetoric. It is the delivering of jobs, of providing certainty and capacity to individuals to run their own lives. And that is what we concentrate on whilst the Australian Labor Party play their games. So what other things have we done? We've not only created these job opportunities, we've also ensured, for example, that on the migration front we have rejected the UN compact 
on migration. Where does Labor stand on that? We have rejected paying $400 million to the International Climate Fund. Where does Labor stand on that? More indebtedness to an international climate fund, and where would we be borrowing the money from? Undoubtedly from China. And who wants to reach into this international climate fund? China. So we borrow money from China to pay into the climate fund so they can get it, so we can then repay China with interest. This is the ALP economic model. And so the list goes on. And that is why, whilst there may have been some untidiness on the government side, as there has been on the opposition side, what I would say to my fellow Australians is don't judge the Labor Party on their rhetoric, judge them on their record, judge us on our record, and the 1.1 million jobs speak for themselves. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Watt. Um, Deputy President, well, I was thinking that the remarks of Kelly O'Dwyer, the Minister for Jobs and Industrial Relations, last night may have been a little unfair when she said that in the Liberals' crisis meeting that the Liberals are now viewed as homophobic, anti-women, and climate change deniers. But then Senator Babetz got up and made a contribution, and I realised she had absolutely nailed it because um, I think we all know the kind of people in her own party that she's actually talking about. Well, what a day in the Liberal Party and what a day in Canberra. Uh, as I was coming down to this sitting week on Sunday, I thought to myself, well, I know for sure that the government is going to have some kind of debacle over the course of the next week. I just wasn't sure what it would be. And I didn't have to wait long. I only had to wait a couple of days to see what the debacle of this sitting week will be. Um, but then again, I suppose that the week is still early. We might see more. And just in one day, what we've seen from the government is the former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop out in the media saying that the government should agree to the na uh, National Energy Guarantee and should reach an agreement with the Labor Party on energy policy in exactly the way that we have attempted uh, to reach an agreement with this government for the last two or three years. So Julie Bishop has heard the message out of the Victorian election and knows that people want to see some action on climate change from her government. Uh, we also read this morning that under the former Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, the government was about to introduce a National Integrity Commission and, of course, he was then deposed and the idea of an Integrity Commissioner, uh, Commission was deposed with him. That was all before we got to the morning tea and then we didn't have long to wait before we saw the spectacular resignation of the member for Chisholm, Julia Banks. And Julia Banks uh, absolutely crucified her party with the, th the things that she had to say about them, uh, pointing to the fact that they had completely lost touch with what the people of Australia want to see from their government and have become completely obsessed with themselves. Um, she also very much pointed the finger at uh, the reactionary and regressive right wing of her party, and that's her words, uh, who talk to themselves rather than listen to the people of Australia. So whether it be Julie Bishop on the one hand, whether it be uh, nobbling a National Integrity Commissioner on the other, and now the resignation of the member for Chisholm, Julia Banks, this government is even in more disarray than what it was this time yesterday, and that really is saying something. And haven't coalition senators had a good day responding to all of these incidents? Uh, first, we saw one of them quoted by the Herald Sun as saying that excuse my language, the effing place is falling apart. I think that's a pretty accurate summary of the way this government is operating. Uh, then during question time, I noticed on Twitter that one coalition senator texted Alice Workman from BuzzFeed telling her, I hope you're enjoying the dying days of the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government. Uh, now, I don't say this to gloat because I think that all Australians are just absolutely dismayed by what they see from their government day in, day out, day out here in Canberra. Because the truth is that this is a government that has stopped governing. They have stopped listening to what the people of Australia want to see from their government, and all they can do is fight amongst themselves, text journalists, speak to journalists about how embarrassed they are by their own government, and all the time ignore what it is that Australians want to see from them. And the losers from this government's disarray are Australians themselves and, and, as a senator from Queensland, I'm of course particularly concerned about what's happening to Queenslanders under this government. Because I know for a fact that Queenslanders, what they want from this government is secure jobs, 
and wages that are increasing. And instead, they get more casualisation, more labour hire and wages that are barely growing, the lowest we've ever seen on record. What Queenslanders want to see from this government is well-funded schoolers and hospitals, and instead what they get are more and more cuts to schools and hospitals. Queenslanders want to see more investment in their TAFEs, in their training organisations, in their universities, to make sure that both young people and older mature age workers get the skills that they need to be able to compete for the jobs in the future. And what do they get from this government? Again, they get cuts to TAFE, cuts to training and cuts to universities. And what Queenslanders want to see is a fair taxation system where millionaires and big business do pay their fair share, uh, what, but what they get from this government is attempts to reduce the tax burden on the top end of town. This government is so divided, so distracted, that it has completely lost touch with what Queenslanders and Australians want to see. The sooner we get to an election, the better. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. There can be no denying that when there are state and federal elections, uh, depending on the results of those state and federal elections, it causes political parties and members of parliament and candidates and party organisations to take a very, very hard look at themselves. Uh, there's no doubt that the Victorian state election results for the coalition over the weekend have given us a very fresh opportunity to revisit the way that we are approaching our issues, to revisit the way we're engaging with the Australian community. But that happens to all parties. That happens to all parties and it happens over time. So my caution, my caution to Labor senators on the other side is don't get too cocky. Don't get too cocky, because you will fall over yourself. You will fall over yourself. Because there are some important lessons for the Liberal Party in the Victorian state election result. But in the first instance, I will trust the attitudes and opinions and perceptions of Victorian Liberals before a West Australian senator like myself will comment on what's happened in Victoria. But a very, very unique opportunity for the Liberal Party to take a hard look at itself before we go into the next federal election. Now, yesterday, Senator Cormann gave the Labor opposition in the Senate a wonderful opportunity to come back into the Australian Senate today and ask questions about the economic performance of the government. Yesterday, Senator Cormann shared with the Senate what the OECD and the IMF had been saying about the performance of the Australian economy. And why is that important? Why is that important? because that is the single most important issue that is confronting Australian families. What do their future employment opportunities look like? What do their future growth opportunities look like? How are they going to raise their families and ensure that their children and grandchildren have employment opportunities into the future? But no, Labor senators today couldn't risk the opportunity to talk politics, play politics, focus on issues that are so far away from the minds of ordinary Australian families and small business owners, so far away from the minds of Australian families in my home state of Western Australia, in New South Wales, in the Northern Territory, because these are the issues that are top of mind to Australian families and small businesses. What does the economic future of our country look like? It is as simple as that. And that is not an alternative government on the other side of the Senate chamber. That is not an alternative government. These people want to play politics, petty-minded politics, when in actual fact, when you leave Canberra, the issues that are important to Australian families beyond here are much bigger, are more significant than that. And why do they not want to talk about the Australian economy? Why would Labor senators not want to ask Senator Cormann and other economic ministers about the Australian economy? The answer to that is the word Paul Keating. The answer to that is Paul Keating, because what Senator Cormann shared with the Australian Senate yesterday was what Paul Keating had to say about Bill Shorten. Let's be very, very clear about this. If there is a Labor government, it will not look like the Hawke and Keating government. It will not look like the Hawke and Keating government. It will be a dangerous Labor government. I'll come to that in one moment. What did Paul Keating say about Bill Shorten and the Labor Party. He said that Labor has 
lost the ability to speak inspirationally sorry lost the ability to speak aspirationally to people and to fashion policies to meet those aspirations that's what paul keating said no one knows the australian labor party better in this country than paul keating and he said that labor has lost the ability to speak aspirationally to people and to finish fashion policies to meet those aspirations and why would paul keating say that why would paul keating say that Paul Keating says that because he knows that Labor has no plan for growth. No plan for growth. You have a plan for taxes. You have a plan for taxes on retirees. You have a plan for taxes on families. You have a plan for tax on small businesses. But you have no plan for growth. So Australian families and Australian small businesses, when they come out of the <coughs> summer holidays next year, they're going to be presented with a very, very stark choice. And on this point alone, Senator Cameron was absolutely right. Australians will have a very stark and clear choice. A choice between employment growth, economic growth, delivered by a coalition government led by Scott Morrison, or a plan for taxes and no growth that will impoverish Australian Thank families you, and Senator small Smith. Your time has expired and I remind you in future to refer to those in the other place by their correct titles. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Well, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So said Winston Churchill, uh, and he was paraphrasing, in fact, a philosopher from the previous century. Well, you might have thought that the Wentworth by-election presented an opportunity to learn something from history. Because after the Wentworth by-election, they all piled on, didn't they? All of those conservatives, all of those people in the hard right who wanted to insist that despite the fact that voters came to the polling booths wanting to talk about climate change, wanting to talk about the cuts to the ABC and the attacks on the ABC, wanting to talk about our international obligations, wanting to talk about a fair and decent Australia, the Conservatives in the Liberal Party learnt nothing from that election. They went away and they determined that, that what they would do was double down, that they would continue with race baiting, that they would continue with the culture wars, that they would continue with the petty internecine feuds within the Liberal Party that are all about dragging that organisation over into a part of Australian politics that barely has a base. So extreme is it. That was their lesson. There was no teachable moment at the Wentworth by-election for this crowd. They just decided to double down. Well, they've had another opportunity presented to them on the weekend in Victoria because this same set of nasty, mean-spirited, small-minded attitudes were on display through the entirety of the Victorian campaign. And those attitudes were utterly repudiated by Victorians. Now, there is some public reflection going on, and Senator Smith said he'd take the observations that come from his Victorian colleagues. Well, I point into some of them. No less than our Senate President, Scott Ryan, said our voters sent us a message, and that is that some of the noise that comes out of this place and some of the noise that comes out of commentators about what it means to be a Liberal, well, Liberal voters want us to focus on their issues. And he went on to say that the party was losing its electoral base who didn't want conservative views rammed down their throat. The former Liberal MP, Ms Banks, who is now an independent uh, member for Chisholm, explained that they'd been led by reactionary members of the right wing, and she said that the coup was aided by many MPs trading their vote for a leadership change in exchange for a promotion, pre-selection or silence. Their actions were undeniably for themselves, she said. She's speaking about a hard core of people who want to use the institutions of the parliament and their party for their own advancement rather than the interests of the Australian people. But the thing that comes most through most strongly in the public discussion by Liberals in Victoria is actually a focus on climate and energy, because this is the signature failure of this government over the last five years. And so Kelly O'Dwyer, Ms O'Dwyer, has reported to have told colleagues that the Liberals are now widely regarded as homophobic, anti-women and climate change deniers. And the member for Goldstein, Mr Wilson, was even clearer, saying that if anyone thinks there is a great public sentiment out there that people hate renewables and they're hugging coal, well, I say get real. The very sad thing for the Liberal Party, if they truly reflected 
on the history of the last five years is that they've had plenty of opportunities. Because as a Labor Party, we wanted, we wanted to establish a bipartisan energy policy that could deal with climate change. And we offered bipartisanship. We offered it in relation to the energy intensity scheme proposed by Mr Frydenberg. We offered it in relationship uh, to the clean energy target, which was proposed by Dr Finkel, who spent a great deal of time examining the energy system. And we certainly offered it in, relationship, uh, in relation to the NEG, a policy that they put through their party room and then walked away from it. And we offer it still, because what business will tell you—business will tell anyone who listens is that all they need is certainty in relation to energy policy. There is an investment strike on at the moment. We have energy facilities which are ageing, operating past their use-by date, and they need to be replaced. But no private sector investor wants to act at the moment because this government, over five years, has been incapable to produce any clear energy policy. And in that environment, investors have gone on strike. That is what has driven prices up. That is what all of our organisations paid to advise us tell us. And until they take the opportunity to collaborate, they will Thank continue you, to Senator fail Cameron, on this front. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Cameron be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele John. Uh, thank you. I move a motion to take note of answers given by Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, what an absolute joke. What a farce. Earlier today, I asked a question of the minister representing the so called Prime Minister in this place. Why did he feel, why did our Prime Minister feel? that the House of Representatives was the appropriate place for him to criticise the young people of Australia? Why did he feel that it was his role to tell thousands of young people who are so concerned about the impact of climate change on their future that they should simply sit down, shut up and go back to school. And what did we hear? What did we hear from this crumbling, directionless, miserable excuse of a flea-bitten administration? What did we hear? Oh, kids should be in school. That was the only response given. Kids should be in school. Well, I tell you something. The young people of Australia look to the actions of this government in this place, and they are revolted. They see behaviour that, if it was used in their classroom, they would be admonished, they would be expelled, and yet it is part of the course in this place. They see a government willing to roll out the red carpet to the coal barons, to the gas merchants, who are willing to chop and blast and bench their future, their environment, to make a quick buck. They look to these things and they are revolted. They demand of us that we work for them, that we hold clearly in our mind in every action that we take, that our role here is to serve the young people of Australia and create a better future for them. They are connected. They hear what we say in here. They watch us closely. They can see very clearly that when the Prime Minister so patronisingly dismisses the concerns of young people when it comes to climate change, when he drags himself into this building holding a lump of coal like a talisman, 
He does so at the behest of his donors. He does so because he knows that to do any differently is to be unable to fund his election campaigns, to be able to plaster the airwaves and the television screens with cruel, racist, xenophobic nonsense, which so now comprises an election campaign run by the Liberal Party. The moral compass of this government was long sold, long sold off long ago to the highest bidder, to the Gina Reinharts and Andrew Forrests, who so covet the wealth of my state, who right now prowl the halls of my state parliament, singing the siren song of a fracking industry that will turn the water to poison. The young people of this nation look to this chamber. They plead with us to put them first, to act for once in their interests. And once again they have been shown that this administration has no desire to hear them. Well, shame on the lot of you. And when that election day comes, when your rendezvous with defeat is upon you, you will know, you will know how sorely you have underestimated the young people of this nation. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. The question is the motion moved by Senator Steelejohn be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.